Real Agriculture.com's coverage of Crop Week in Saskatoon is brought to you by FarmLink Marketing Solutions, BioVision Seed Labs, the Canadian Wheat Board, and High Stick MT. Well, it does improve production in the way that when a plant has a better rooting environment, it obviously will develop better. It's, it's as simple as that. And um, farmers often fear the so-called yield dip when they convert from what they do to conservation agriculture. In my own experience, I never saw that yield dip happening. And I don't see any reason in the system that would justify such a yield dip. Where we have a yield dip, it's mainly due to inexperience in using the new system because we talk about a completely different way of doing agriculture, which means we have different wheat issues, we have different pest issues, we have different nutrient issues. And if we don't know these issues, we can make mistakes and that can lead to a yield dip, especially when we start from a high production level. But when we don't do these mistakes, then we can actually have a yield increase from the very beginning. And there are examples, for example, in the, in the US, there is a program in Washington State, a, a mentoring program for conservation agriculture farmers that experienced farmers take newcomers under their wing and help them for the first year to adopt the new system. And if you compare those farmers with farmers that try no-till farming on their own, the, the, the first ones usually have a yield increase in the, in, the, in the beginning and the other ones do see this yield dip. It does. In the long term it does definitely. We see, especially in the soil, the diversity and the soil life picking up and getting into dimensions which we don't know under tillage-based systems. And that affects directly the nutrient availability and dynamics in the soils. In different ways, for example, on, on, on phosphate, we, we see a much better mobility on phosphates, especially in tropical soils where we often have phosphate problems. Not that there is no phosphate in the soils, but it's, it's tied up. And with the organic uh, assets in these higher, richer organic soils and the, the soil life, uh, we get a much better mobility of phosphates. We get things like mycorrhiza becoming a standing feature in our soils helping the plants to take up phosphates which in a tillage based soils is very difficult to get. Rhizobia grow much better in no-till soils than in tilled soils. In India for example if you plow a soil and leave it in, in 40-50 degrees uh, temperature baking in the sun there's no way to keep a rhizobia bacteria alive in that soil so you have to inoculate every time new while in a no-till situation you might even find free-living rhizobia bacteria in the soil that take up uh, nitrogen from the air and help the plants even like, like wheat plants. Uh, so there is a, is a number of, of processes happening in the soil. Also the rooting environment is much bigger. If we don't have a plow pan, if we don't have this separation of a loose topsoil and a fairly compact subsoil, the roots will venture into much bigger soil volumes. Uh, we have a much deeper rooting uh, depths of our crops, which means the pool of nutrients they can reach is much bigger. And we see that even with lower nutrients in our soil analysis on those soils, our fertilizer requirements are less than on compared uh, uh, tilled soils. And, and all these things we are just scratching. We, we don't know yet very much detail on that, but those are observations which we see in countries like Brazil partly also here in Canada where we have a long-term experience of no-till farming systems. But there's still much more to explore and that's what, what Doyle mentioned, that even here we shall not content ourselves saying, oh we do this no-till farming for 20-30 years, we have, we have got it. No, it's a new way of agriculture and the research potential is still huge and we still have to further develop that. Well, that is actually in practically all cases where we see governments buying into that. It's addressing issues like erosion, like drought. Um, China, for example, they have huge problems with wind erosion and with uh, water erosion. 
and um, only al around the Olympic Games in Beijing, uh, they had a program to accelerate the adoption of conservation agriculture in a belt around Beijing to protect the Olympic Games from the dust storms. Because these dust storms don't come from the desert. They come from the cropland because it's fine dust and it's not, not sandy dust from the desert which would settle after a few kilometers. This fine dust goes up into the air and goes across North Korea, goes to Japan and, and is creating much more problems than the, 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 the closer desert uh, uh, problems. So uh, that's the first line of defense. But in, in countries like China also the drought problems, the, the recent big droughts is a major threat to the country and uh, conservation agriculture is actually helping to address these broad problems and we have evidence on that that you can grow a crop with much less water without having a complete crop failure yes well i think uh, in canada it has developed out of the no-till but um, we can still learn that it is a, it's really a complete agricultural system and it's not an, an option to say oh it doesn't work for me this year I go back to the plow it's really we have to find for whatever problems we have a solution within that context of sticking on to the no-till as a concept and I think there is still a lot to learn especially with the residue issues with with crop rotations diversity um, and that's also where policymakers should come in there should be some incentive to go for diversity and we see often market distortions luring farmers to go away and, and uh, go for a specific crop. That happens even in, in Argentina or Brazil now with soybean. Soybean is so attractive that it's hard for farmers to resist to only grow soybean. And soybean as a monocrop, even under no tillage, doesn't help you with erosion control, doesn't help you with, with carbon sequestration. And uh, there must be some mechanisms to buffer that up and, and, and take these incentives from the farmers to really succumb to these temptations. Does canola fall under that category then? Well, canola, um, if you would only grow canola, certainly it would also not be, be helpful. It would lead you into pest issues. And we see that happening in, in, in countries like Germany, for example, where with the biofuel hype, uh, many farmers embarked on growing only canola and nothing else. And, and the pests came a few years later uh, without, without any, any major delay. No? Yeah.